Well, thank you for joining us today. It's a terrific day um, to be at the National Constitution Center. Actually, every day is a terrific day to be here, but this is especially wonderful day for our, because we have some terrific guests. Before we get into our program, I just want to reintroduce myself and talk about a little bit about the logistics here. Uh, I am Michael Gerhardt. I'm the scholar in residence here at the National Constitution Center, and that is a wonderful thing to be. I also teach constitutional law at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And we do all sorts of wonderful programs here at the National Constitution Center. I want to just tell you about a couple of upcoming ones. Next week, we'll host a, two back-to-back -back panels on gerrymandering and the future of American democracy with scholars and advocates on both sides. On December 15th, we will bring back our annual Bill of Rights Day Symposium, which will feature three constitutional conversations on the state of the First Amendment, how the first 10 amendments came to the Bill of Rights, and James Madison. Pennsylvania Continuing Legal Credit will also be offered at all three of those programs. Only National Constitution Center members receive free tickets, free tickets to our town hall programs and discounted tickets to Blockbuster's evening programs and CLE offerings. And for more information on membership or the upcoming schedule, please visit the membership table in the Kirby lobby. Now, let me do the honor of introducing our guest speakers today. To my far left, David Blight is Professor of History at Yale University, the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. He is the author of several books, most recently, American Oracle, The Civil War and the Civil Rights Era. Tavolia Glimpf is a professor of history at Duke University in the Departments of History and African, Amer and African American Studies and a faculty affiliate of the Duke University Population Research Institute and the Program in Women's Studies. She has published numerous articles and essays and is the author of the prize winning Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household and co-editor of two volumes of Freedom, A Documentary History of Emancipation, 1861 to 1867. I'm sorry to say that our colleague Eric Thoner was unable to make it today, but that just gives each of you more time. <laughs> and Eric has promised to return on a future occasion. The topic of Reconstruction is second to none in its importance. Um, I want to be able to talk to each of you about the book that you've contributed to, at least at the beginning, and then we'll move into a discussion about Reconstruction more generally. The book is called Beyond Freedom, Disrupting the History of Emancipation. David, you were one of the co-editors of the book. Could you tell us a little bit about what the purpose of the book is and what Beyond Freedom is all about? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Thank you all for coming out at lunchtime. And don't worry about Eric. He's going to be all right. He's got a health issue that suddenly hit him, but he's going to be fine. And neither of us is Eric Foner, in case you were. I am. Yeah. I resent that, I am. Oh, okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're all in his legacy anyway. Anyway, uh, this book came out of, it's a book of essays. It came out of a conference we sponsored at the Gilda Lehrman Center at Yale at least uh, three, four years ago. It was an attempt particularly by uh, Jim Downs and Greg Downs, the Downs boys, no relation. Uh, they came to me and we, ha we planned it together. They wanted to revisit as scholars, as historians, you get the best people in the room for two days. The great issue of emancipation. Now, emancipation had been, Thavolio well knows because you worked on the Freedman's Papers Project, <clears throat> among others. Emancipation has been a huge question among scholars now for 40, 50 years, in great part because 30, 40, and 50 years ago, we all discovered, hiding in plain sight, as Tom Hope used to say, the thousands upon thousands of documents in the National Archives produced by the Civil War, and particularly by the military, and then by the Freedmen's Bureau, this massive documentation. It is the most documented emancipation of slaves in world history. That came about because armies keep great records. Uh, if you're going to have an emancipation, have it during time of war, if you're thinking about the scholars. So revisit this after many great books and this tremendous documentary collection, which is still going on. And, and also revisit it from the point of view that perhaps uh, it needs a less celebratory, if that's the proper term, 
a somewhat darker, deeper, harder look at just what freedom meant, how freedom came, how freedom was achieved, and what the cost and consequences were of freedom. Um, you'll, you'll find essays in this volume on all sorts of elements of the emancipation process, and it is treated as a process, not a moment, not, not the day of jubilee, not a moment of jubilee, not just a legislative, act, I mean, an executive act by President Lincoln, although it was that, but it's treated as a great social process, and a process that occurs in the time of all-out war. It is therefore a process <clears throat> that, is the, that is in the midst of a revolution. And what revolutions do, of course, is they challenge, to say the least, the social order. They bring about social chaos. They force political reimagining. They force constitutional, legal reimagining. The effort of this book, this conference we did, was to bring together oh, up to 20 people, more actually, who are doing new work on such stories as the contraband camps. Now we've known there were contraband camps for a long time and there's remarkable documentation of them in the National Archives, but they had not been really studied that much until the last, I'd say, 10 years or so. These were the camps, refugee sites, some of them very large with thousands of ex-slaves in them, some of them smaller, mostly around the rim of the South, the rim of the Confederacy, a famous one in Washington, D.C. Tavolia writes about one in her essay uh, with the savagely ironic name Inferno. Do I remember that right? Uh, but these contraband camps were the sites, the places to which escaped slaves managed to get to, and with time they became relatively formalized places, but still camps run by the War Department. And now we've got people studying this, and some are in this book, who are showing us that that process of emancipation was itself bloody, deadly, often disease-ridden. I don't know what the precise uh, st going statistic is now, but some of the people who have studied contraband camps, and Chandra Manning has a new book out on them, uh, as do a couple other people, is that possibly as much as one of every four refugee slaves who escaped to such contraband camps probably died in the process. There's an essay in the book, for example, by Carol Emberton. It's a fascinating attempt to try to get at, so how can historians study emotions? How can we try to get at uh, a story like grief? and loss in the midst of this great human story of freedom. I mean, emancipation is, in many ways, arguably the pivot of American history, certainly in the 19th century. The freedom of the slaves in the midst of this war and then the preservation of the Union, which becomes dependent on that freedom of four million people, is, is the pivot of 19th century American history. You could make a case that it's the pivot of America, certainly a pivot in constitutional history, to say the least. But it is not just a happy story. It never was. Uh, it never can be. Jim Downs, for example, uh, the co-editor and who did most of the work on this book, <laughs> um, has done a book called Sick of Freedom. He found records in the National Archives uh, that were, in effect, uh, uh, bleak and terrible health records of some of these contraband camps. Um, and and he, he calls the emancipation process uh, a health or a public health catastrophe. Now this isn't just an attempt by historians to darken history and make it all bleak and make it a no exit story and make you depressed, which is what some people think we get up every day to do. It's just, you know, to, you know, tell you about shame and things that are terrible and you know, oppression studies. It's not that at all. But let's, let's and then I'll, then I'll be quiet, but let's just remember, a war that killed now, we believe, about roughly 750,000 Americans and 
an emancipation process that occurs in historical time practically overnight freed four million people from centuries of bondage, centuries of chattel slavery into something new called freedom that now has to be defined by the reconstruction process. It comes out of an all out war between the largest armies ever assembled and it happens in enormous bloodshed. That story's got to be told by the truth you find. And a last little note, I always lay this on undergraduates. I, you know, I play with them and I sort of, it's sort of a bad rhetorical question, but I always say, so why was the American emancipation the most violent? And of course, they can't quite answer that yet. That's, that's not a good teaching technique, but it's kind of fun because they squirm. Why was, you know, of all the 20 some odd emancipations in the, in the 19th century across the world, especially the Western world, British Empire, French Empire, Dutch Empire, et cetera, et cetera, down to Cuba and Brazil in the 1880s, why was it only the emancipation in the United States that happened in this kind of bloodshed? That doesn't mean all the other emancipations weren't violent, but none of them cost this many lives. Why? You know, and we play around, we play around with the idea. And I mean, I, I, and of course, it's a bad teaching technique because I have the answer I want, right? You're not supposed to teach that way. But, and the answer is in part because the United States was a republic. The society, the side that owned the slaves, the slave society that was part of the American Union was free to dissent. And what is the Confederacy? but the largest dissent in American history. Slaves were freed against that dissent we call the Confederacy, which fought to the utter bitter end to save its society, its system, its slavery. But part of American history, part of our job is explaining why was our emancipation so violent? Why didn't they just get legislated out of existence? Why didn't we just vote it out? Just have a referendum in 1861 instead of a war. Well, we did have a referendum. It was called the election of Lincoln. <laughs> it's, it led to other results. So anyway, uh, this book tries to get at the deeper, uh, less pretty, but fascinating elements of the story of emancipation. Thank you, David. Um, in fact, the fight, of, the fight, of course, to which you refer may not just have ended. What's that, with, sorry? The fight to which you refer may not just have ended, of course, with the secession, the formal yeah. secession of the um, Civil War. Yeah. But Tavoli, I think he's also given you a pretty good introduction here as well. Um, you, you begin your essay with a very powerful prayer you found. Could you tell us about that prayer and how it frames your essay? Okay, so. Let me just frame it by saying that I began working on the question of refugees within the context of the American Civil War. Actually, I wrote my first um, article in 2005. Um, so I've been working on this for a very long time. And um, at some point, it became clear to me that historians um, simply had ignored this huge story. And also, it became clear to me that I didn't think I could tell it. Um, so this is a strange dilemma for a historian because we're trained to go into the archives to sit there for weeks at a time and maybe find one paragraph that's useful. And, and I love being in the archive, um, but the more I, the more time I spent in the archive, the more distressed I became. And I'm not supposed to be distressed. I'm supposed to be scientific. And one day I'm reading a newspaper article from 1863, and it says, um, this is a prayer from a father and he says, and I'm paraphrasing, um, that they are suffering, and he in particular is suffering as he carries his child from place to place, and as black people bury their children in the cold ground. 
I didn't know quite what to do with that prayer. Um, but on a deep level, it, it fit with everything I found in the National Archives, written by commanders, Union and Confederate, written by missionaries who went south to quote unquote help black people. And so I copied the prayer and I put it up on my wall in front of my computer at home. And so every time I sat down to write this book, I was confronted by the prayer. And at some point, I was invited to the Yale conference. And I had been thinking about this prayer and my inability to really come to terms with what the archive showed me, um, or what I was seeing in the archive. Um, this sort of struggle between um, seeing these um, testimonies of utter grief and heartache and death and the murders of women and children. I described in that piece um, uh, one case of many in which children were shot down and they were running across this swampy area and the Confederate soldiers on horseback were chasing them down. And <clears throat> so I trying to figure out how to tell that story. Um, and I write this essay about how hard it is to sit down in the archives in Pennsylvania, in DC, in Mississippi, in Texas, all across the country where I'm going to find bits and pieces of the story. And my heart is breaking and it's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be to break in my personal life, not in my professional life. And, um, and so I write this essay about what that means and, and how I think it's impossible for scholars to read this kind of material and not be affected. And I must say that um, my sentiment is not shared by many historians. There are some historians, including some in the book, who uh, disagree, who think that um, to deal with this kind of tragedy, to write about it, um, would tend to, tends to um, uh, put too much focus on violence, um, and then it becomes kind of gratuitous. And so I, I find that really uh, offensive. Um, how can murder be gratuitous? How many bodies should I not count? Um, for it not to offend you as a reader. And this is, you know, I'm speaking to you. Um, I know this is a very mixed audience of jurists and legal scholars and um, scholars from probably every discipline, people who are um, scholars not necessarily by trade but by inclination. You know, when do, when do you get tired of, of my saying? A hundred women and children died here. Two hundred died here. Um, at this particular site, people were burned up in their cabins. And so when I read another essay in the same volume in which my essay is published, that basically accuses me of being um, uh, using violence to gratuitously, I, I am personally offended and I'm offended as a scholar because the word gratuitous means uncalled for, right? So how much is uncalled for? So that's kind of where that essay, um, uh, you know, where it originates and, and what it's about. Um, and it's, now that I've sort of figured out how to tell the story, I'm, um, I'm finding that that story is central to how we understand what comes next um, in terms of reconstruction. For example, many scholars for a long time have insisted that freedom means a meant to black people the right to reconstitute their families, to vote and so forth. So what does that mean? What does it mean to reconstitute one's family? Um, and what if that reconstituted family doesn't look like the uh, white families? What if it's not normative in some way? Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to, based on what I'm finding in the archive, trying to suggest that 
we don't necessarily have to put black people into this normative framework. We don't have to insist that in order to prove themselves worthy of citizenship and of freedom, they have to establish a two-parent household. Um, and, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm pushing this is because what I'm finding is that many women who ran away, um, and here I should say that we're only talking about 12% of the population who ran away, but many women who ran away uh, ran away with their husbands, who joined the army, and who died. And so what do these widows do? They form households together as widows. So throughout these camps, these refugee camps, and in the, the towns and, and, and areas that grow up, uh, villages that grow up around places like Memphis, um, women who are widows are farming with other women, young people who may be of marriageable age, but who are not interested in each other as marriage partners, are forming households. You know, one woman says, I, I found a way to buy this house, and he found a way to buy some land. And so we are living together to share resources, and we are working the land together. But when <clears throat> federal officials came around, it looked pretty weird to them. And so they said, she must be a prostitute. Well, she was not, but it was a, just a new kind of family formation that grows out of the particular circumstance of that moment. And when we, when we ignore that, I think we risk um, uh, not being able to fully understand what freedom really looked like on the ground. I am very excited about um, all of the new work that's coming out, the sort of beginning to challenge this idea that freedom uh, just meant buying land, getting um, uh, the right to vote for men, those really big tangible things. To me, as I said in, in my in earlier work, to me, freedom could also mean a, a former slave woman being able to, for the first time in her life, buy her own dress. Um, and, and I had found this wonderful example of a woman who bought a blue um, gingham dress, and she was so proud of that. That's freedom, too. Um, and so I, I'm just really excited about the way in which scholars are um, moving to think more broadly about what freedom could mean um, and thinking about it as a, uh, the, the coming of freedom as a, a process, not something that happened mm -hmm. at one moment at one time. And I think back to, for example, and I'm going to stop Sorry. in a minute, uh, to um, Lincoln's um, uh, preliminary uh, emancipation proclamation. And uh, if you, you know, if you, think about what he said. He said three important things, it seems to me, um, including um, that emancipation, he said, should, be, should come, but it should come gradually, and it should be, the slaveholders should be compensated for their slaves. Um, he said in that preliminary proclamation that um, the war this is September of 1862, that the war is about the Union. It's about the states of the United States. And even though within a few months he had decided to um, issue the, um, because the states that he wanted to come back and, and get their money, um, didn't do it, he decided to free the slaves in the Emancipation Proclamation. But what always troubled me about the preliminary emancipation, which most historians sort of celebrate as the sort of um, um, preliminary to the real thing, was Lincoln's willingness to allow the nation state, the United States, to become the largest purchaser of slaves by the terms that he presented. And he says this explicitly, that the federal government 
would be the purchaser, the holder of black people. And I find that quite astounding. Um, and it says a lot about not just where Lincoln was in 1862, but of course where the nation was in 1862. And I'll stop. That's right. Well, thank you. I mean, we, we are obviously talking about very significant, serious things, many of which I think um, we don't know, and many of which we're discovering either the first time, or David, as you point out at the beginning of the book, where history, of course, always involves some reinterpretation, some rediscovery. Um, I think, if I may oversimplify a little bit, to some extent, I think when we learn about Reconstruction in school, it's a little bit like the Civil War ends, fingers snap, and then suddenly everybody's free, equal, and happy. But in fact, that's not true. Uh, on the ground, the story is much different. I think we start learning more about it. So David, maybe if you don't mind, share with us a little bit about what, what the different narratives on Reconstruction are, the different ways in which we've understood Reconstruction, and how <coughs> perhaps our understandings are beginning to be reconstructed themselves. Yeah. Well, Reconstruction is, as most here know, that period we usually date from 1865 to 1877, the so-called disputed election of 1876 and the Compromise of 1877. It's a nice parlor game among historians as to, so when did Reconstruction really end? Did it ever end? <laughs> uh, among all my graduate students over the years, some of them will date the end of it even earlier and then some much later and so on and so forth. Dating, it's just a parlor game, but what Reconstruction is, is a kind of national, social, political, and constitutional referendum on what the war meant. Reconstruction is this massive, chaotic, collective attempt to determine what was the verdict of Appomattox. Not just who won, but what was won and what was defeated. Another way of thinking about it in big terms is Reconstruction had to be about at least three really big things or problems. One was, who will rule in the South? Look, the South lost. If there's any doubt about that, that's a fact. The Confederacy was defeated, really, I mean big time, really defeated. But who's gonna rule now? Is it going to be ex-Confederates in some way? Is it gonna be only Northerners, so-called carpetbaggers? Is it gonna be blacks in some realm of equality with whites? Who's gonna rule in the South? What kinds of governments? What kinds of new constitutions? The second was, who's gonna rule in Washington? The president or Congress? And this brings us the great constitutional crises of Reconstruction that end up in Andrew Johnson's impeachment, among many other crises that are constitutional because the, the country never faced this. There was no blueprint in the Constitution where you could look up, okay, 11 states secede from the Union, you fight an all-out total civil war, one side wins, what do you do now? There's no blueprint in the Constitution. There were fundamentally different visions of what a Reconstruction after this war would mean. Uh, and they tended to play out in the, what we tend to call Congressional Reconstruction led by the Republican, uh, the radical Republican leadership of the original Republican Party. And then Andrew Johnson, uh, who wasn't really even a Democrat, but, uh, but Johnson with the Democrats, the then Democrats, Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats to some extent, who wanted a very limited reconstruction, a lenient reconstruction, or as Andrew Johnson famously put it, uh, the Constitution as it was, and the, no, the, Constitu the Constitution as it is, and the Union as it was. Put the Union back together, but don't touch the Constitution. Don't touch the idea of black rights. And the third huge question was, what did black freedom mean? What were the dimensions of black freedom? Four million people have been freed from slavery. Who are they now? Are they gonna be citizens? If so, how? Under what kind of definition? What rights will they have? Will they have civil liberty? Will they have political liberty? Who will protect that? These are revolutionary problems that this war presented the country with. It's why scholars now, and we have been for, gosh, a generation and more, 
been calling the Civil War a second American revolution, or Reconstruction in particular, a second American revolution. And that language has gone into legal history, for sure. The second constitution, you know, uh, written in Washington as opposed to the one written here in Philadelphia, which was in the 18th century, as I'm sure you know. Um, so Reconstruction is this tremendous challenge, this referendum that the country has to, and it has to have it quickly. What did that war mean? And you're trying to do it with a degree, a level of loss, of death, loss, suffering, and bitterness, and hatred that Americans had never experienced before. I mean, the, the challenge of Reconstruction is the, is the whole challenge of uh, what we do with Civil War memory to begin with, and it's one of the reasons it's still never over. Uh, you had to have healing, that the country had to be healed somehow, but you also had to have justice, some kind of new justice. Justice for whom? And who gets to decide? What did healing mean to white Georgians or South Carolinians who had experienced Sherman's march and had lost everything? What did healing mean to black families who had lost people as well, but now we're trying to constitute something called family and trying to imagine getting land, making a life with dignity? And sometimes freedom, one of the things you end up studying when you study emancipation is this idea of dignity, what did dignity mean to former slaves? It didn't just mean the right to vote. It meant address. It meant respect. It meant somebody actually uh, considering you a citizen. It meant a school for your kid. God, was that dignity. You know. So these are unprecedented problems at that time for Americans. Uh, and where, did they, where could they look? in their own history, what could they look in world history for the template for this, for the model for this? It, it wasn't necessary. Now, they had places legally and politically they could look in the past, the smartest of them, but this is what they faced. Uh, how do you have healing and justice after an all-out civil war? The world's still trying to figure that out. We've got civil wars going on all over the world right now, and they're all going to end somehow, and then that society is going to face healing and justice. Now, we can get into more of the specifics, if you want, about how yeah. Reconstruction plans yeah. evolved. Uh, uh, but this, this third big challenge, what does black freedom mean? What are, what are its dimensions? Is it the heart of it all? I mean, the, the great contest between the, the radical Republicans and the Democrats and Andrew Johnson is ultimately about what is black freedom going to mean? They don't always put it that way, but that is what they're talking about. Is America going to recreate, is the South going to recreate a white supremacist society as rigid as, as the slave regime, if not worse, or is it going to have a whole new experiment in racial democracy, which many of the radical Republican leaders truly tried? Mm. That they didn't entirely succeed is part of the story. Tavelli, I may pick up a little bit on that third question, if I may, and, uh, and maybe ask it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when we think about Reconstruction, we study Reconstruction, it seems to go without much second thought that, of course, it's about race. But is it, a ju is it just about race? To what extent does gender become a factor? To what extent do other things, such as family, which I know you've studied in great detail, begin to matter as well. In order, uh, so this concept of freedom we're wrestling with, it seems to be something about, it seems to go beyond race, at least to some extent. The way I would answer that is that it, it is more than, about more than race. Um, and to piggyback on, on what David said, in order for the nation to heal, um, in order for um, there to be meaning behind what Lincoln called a new birth of freedom, we had to think about freedom as more than quote unquote black freedom. We had to think about freedom as a human right. And as long as we think about freedom and compartmentalize it as black freedom, then we forget um, that 
black, the, the, the emancipation of enslaved people required that there be an adjustment in what freedom meant for white people as well. Um, so the whole notion that freedom is something that we're wrestling with because black people become free um, should be sort of tempered um, by the fact that freedom is something that we're wrestling with as a Western democracy and have been wrestling with since uh, the nation was founded. And I always tell my students that the Civil War is not the first Civil War that Americans fought, right? Um, to some extent, the Revolutionary War was a civil war. And that war was also about trying to figure out what freedom meant. And in 1865, the freedom of black people called upon the nation to reconsider what freedom for white people meant as well, not just in the South, but in the North as well, where you still had discriminatory laws where black men still could not vote everywhere. Um, and so I think um, it's not just about gender, it's not just about race, but it's about um, a national kind of reconceptualizing of the very meaning of freedom. You can't determine what black people um, what black freedom means unless you have a sense of what freedom means for the country as a whole. And we didn't really have that. And, and it's not, we don't have to just go to black people to understand that we didn't have this national understanding of freedom. You can look at the, the plight of poor white men um, who for a long time didn't have the right to vote. You can look at the plight of yeoman white women who struggled differently from elite white women. So were they free? Uh, were these poor white men who decided during the war that they would not have anything to do with the Confederacy but resisted by hiding out in the swamps of the woods or by running away or by deserting, did they have the same idea about freedom that slaveholders had? No. Um, so I think it's much more complicated than just a juxtaposition of white versus black freedom. So David, come, as we sort of build on this and get a, hopefully a, a deeper, richer sense of reconstruction and what's going on, I want to come to a question I mentioned to you in the green room. As we think about reconstruction, is it possible to look at what's happening post-Civil War as some affirmation of the failure of federalism? Mm -hmm. So as we grapple with freedom and, and equality, which are huge concepts, of course, intertwined with all this, one thing that seems to be confronting the people that are about to amend the Constitution through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments right. is that federalism itself might have failed during this period. Mm -hmm. Yes, one of the worst mistakes we can make in all of our stress on race and slavery, which Tabola and I have come of age studying, is to assume that the, the war and Reconstruction weren't about states' rights and federalism. It surely was. <laughs> There's no question it was. Federalism and states' rights for what now? At the heart of, just at the heart of the coming of the Civil War, but you could argue even more so, at the heart of Reconstruction are two fundamentally different, they're variations, but they're two fundamentally different visions of federal power and state power. Now, you've got a group of Republicans now, these are the so-called radical Republicans who for, a, for a, you know, three minutes in historical time had control. <laughs> Uh, the Thaddeus Stevenses and Charles Sumners and Benjamin Wades and others who believed in activist interventionist government. That's actually a term Eric Foner, I learned from Eric. I don't know who he borrowed it from or if he, he may have made it up. Activist interventionist government. But let's remember, this is a Republican Party now by 1866 and 67, which is going to fashion the Reconstruction Acts and pass the first civil rights law in American history, the Great Civil Rights Act of 1866, which Andrew Johnson will famously veto. But this is a group of Republicans. Look what they've just done. They've just won an all-out war by highly centralizing the federal government because they had to. They formed the biggest armies in history. They created something called the Quartermaster Corps, which was the, which was the huge federal agency that, that delivered and negotiated all the business contracts, the manufacturing contracts, all over the North that made all the materiel for Grant and Sherman's armies. The Quartermaster Corps was the second largest employer in the country by 1864. The only larger, larger employer was the Union Army. <laughs> 
There'd never been a quartermaster court. They passed the Homestead Act, which is going to revolutionize how people get land in the West. They passed the Morrill Act, which was land-grant colleges. I went to Michigan State claims to be the first land-grant college, but so does Cornell and so do four or five others. But, you know, we'll fight about that forever. Um, <laughs> and, and they passed the, con the, the Transcontinental Railroad, which was possibly one of the most corrupt deals between the federal government and private enterprise ever. But nevertheless, this came by subsidies from the federal government to build the great dream of the, con the, con the transcontinental railroads. And above all, though a lot of them might not have believed they'd have done it in 1861, they just engineered the largest confiscation of private property in all of American history in the Emancipation Proclamation. They're going to confiscate three and a half billion dollars of private property to win this war. That's government. And millions of Americans came to believe, oh, and I forgot, they managed a whole new pretty revolutionary form of currency called the greenback dollar, mm -hmm. which financed this massive war costing four million bucks a day by 1864. Mm -hmm. No one ever imagined federal expenses on this scale. And sometimes when I run into people who, who, who don't like government, they want, they want government limited, they don't want, I, I sometimes want, I want to grab them by the lapel and say, would you have preferred to lose the Civil War? How about World War II? There's another, that was a big war too. Pretty good that we won that one. But, but there they are in 1866, and they're responsible now for this emancipation. And along comes a, a John Bingham, just as an example, and then I'll pass it on, of Ohio. An evangelical Christian, Republican, he'd been an abolitionist, not a radical abolitionist, but he'd been an abolitionist. He'd served on the, on the uh, tribunal or the commission that investigated the Lincoln assassination. I think he even chaired it. Quite a legal mind. Bingham wrote Section 1 of the 14th Amendment which, I mean, Michael's the expert here, but which is arguably the most important thing in our Civil War Reconstruction Constitution. It, keeps, it probably is the one thing that holds us together. If there's anything that can truly hold us together now, it's Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. That's birthright citizenship and equal protection under the law. And in speech after speech after speech on the floor of Congress when they were debating this historic amendment to really change the nature of federalism, Bingham over and over got up and said, what we are doing is federalizing the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. we're, mean, we're, we're saying now, contrary to, to our first 80 some years of history, the Bill of Rights, those first 10 amendments, are now enforceable by the federal government, quote, in the states. Now it's not gonna work out that way historically, but, but that's what he intended, and he was not alone. And he's basing it on the fact now, we just won this massive war of necessity. We destroyed slavery. We're responsible now for the rights of these people, whatever we determine those rights to be, in the states. Now, just think what that means. That means the states are not supposed to have jurisdiction over any jurisprudence about the Bill of Rights. Federal courts will. It's not going to happen that way because Americans, it's a long story, American jurisprudence was not prepared for that kind of fundamental shift in federalism. It's too bad, but it's true. But, you know, the, the, the Reconstruction is a huge tug of war between this, this it's as old as our original Constitution, the struggle between what exactly are the powers of the federal government and the states. And those mm -hmm. powers got vastly changed by the Civil War. The question was, would they stay changed? Right. <laughs> um, would, or would the power of state sovereignty, especially when used now by the resurgent Democratic Party in the South and its vision, let's just be honest, its vision was a virulent white supremacist vision which was not going to tolerate black civil rights, black right. political rights, or for that matter, even black land ownership. Right. And in the 1870s, beginning 1871, and then by 75, 76, 
all of the ex-Confederate states except three by the election of 1876 had been taken back, the control of those states had been taken back by the Southern Democrats um, and they were in effect defeating the reconstruction process that had been put in place. So we haven't entirely explained what that process is yet. But federalism is at the heart of this. Andrew Johnson's vision of reconstruction was once again, the constitution as it is, the union as it was. He was willing to accept the end of slavery, but that's it. Whereas the, Rep the Republicans at that time, by and large, were saying, no, 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 no. Uh, the Constitution must be changed, and they will do it in the 13th, 14th, and 15th right. Amendments, um, and the Union as it was, but only after the Constitution is changed. Well, you mentioned that historians are bleak and depressing. There's nobody more depressing and bleaker than constitutional law people, um, of, of, what, of, which I, of which I'm one. You guys are important. Uh, well, it remains to be put seen. It in language everybody can it get. It remains to be <laughs> seen. Um, Tavoli, I'm going to sort of uh, tee up my question a little bit because I asked about failure, of course, and you, ta you went through, of course, quite well what's going on to complicate Reconstruction. Failure comes um, from the courts. And that's where I'm headed, yes. Okay, um, and so um, part, of the, the part of the failure, of course, um, in the background of Reconstruction is not just that of the states, but it may be that of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court, in horrific decision, uh, Dred Scott, rules, among other things, that African Americans are not citizens of the United States, nor may they ever be. Mm -hmm. That portion of Dred Scott is overruled through the first part of the 14th Amendment you just mentioned. Right. But of course, in the very first case decided by the Supreme Court after the Civil War, called the Slaughterhouse Cases, the Supreme Court says almost what David just said, which is it can't possibly be that something radical was going on here mm -hmm. to, re to change federalism. We can't conceive of that. Right. And then, of course, now we get to the question, does that lead us to conclude that Reconstruction is a failure? Is that how we should look at it? No. no. Okay. Um, the Civil War established the sovereignty of the nation state, and that's mm -hmm. important. Um, so while states still have rights, it's the federal government that has extended its cover to people, to individuals through the 13th, 14th, and even to some extent the 15th Amendment. So I, Reconstruction was a moment, um, and Du Bois even called Reconstruction another civil war, but it was a moment uh, in which black people began to experience freedom, however we may define it, um, by being elected to office, voting um, for people for uh, uh, local and state and municipal offices, uh, where people did gain access to land, where freedom was still being fought for, and the terrain seemed a bit more even, still wobbly, but a, st a bit more even, and at the same time, you see the forces against this kind of federal sovereignty beginning to mobilize, right? To come back on the Democrats and reclaim um, the controls of state and local government in the South. But the, <clears throat> the courts, if we think of, of the war as having um, brought about this kind of uh, uh, federal sovereignty, then the courts are part of that federal sovereignty, including the Supreme Court. So what we don't have is a federal government that's willing to enforce, right, its laws, is willing to enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1866, that's willing to enforce um, the uh, 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. and, and the courts are not, um, willing to, they're not willing to say explicitly that the, the, the rights of freedom, um, to freedom, that is, and citizenship do not matter or can be extinguished, but they are willing to find ways to go around it, which opens the door for Southerners to do all kinds of crafty things, like um, poll taxes and grandfather clauses and so forth. But I, even with the sort of, um, as David described it, the, um, by 1877, 
uh, white Southerners have retaken control. Despite that, I would not consider Reconstruction a failure. Um, it didn't live up to its promises, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a failure. In the same way that some people today argue that emancipation was a quote unquote non-event. That's crazy. Um, they haven't read it. Well, you know, <laughs> clearly. But, so, but it's a huge argument in the academy that it was a non-event just because black people didn't get everything they thought they should get or that yeah. we would expect that they would have gotten. So that would be, uh, But there know. were successes and failures. I mean, it's worth pointing out okay. that federal power was used, for example, by the Grant administration to, in effect, wipe out the Ku Klux Klan, at least during the Reconstruction years. It's going to revive. But uh, Grant used federal power and troops to an extent to go after the Klan. And indeed, Congress even passed three Klan acts mm -hmm. in 70 and 71. Um, and the Freedmen's Bureau was... Oh, and the Freedmen's Bureau, and which the, lasted four years. Which lasted four years, yeah. and, and what also doesn't get talked about in relationship to the Freedmen's Bureau, which is seen as a, this massive government handout to former slaves, is that the, the, the base funding for the Freedmen's Bureau um, came not from taxes of ordinary citizens, but from taxes levied on black women and black men during the Civil War. The millions of dollars that remained from that fund um, collected from their wages during the Civil War were put into something called the Freedmen's Fund. And what was left in 1865 was given to Oliver Howard to fund um, the Freedmen's Bureau. Which amounted to a total of what it cost to fight the war for one day in 1864. You mean the money that the went into- The total money in the Freedmen's Bureau budgets for four years was above $4 million. Well, no, it was a bit more than that because they got about that much when mm -hmm. They were started from the Freedmen's Fund. Okay, well, maybe it would have paid for three days of the okay. war. I mean, <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll compromise I gotta on three on days. Statistic. I got to work on that I got to work on that. Yeah, so, but no, I agree, it's yeah. not much, yeah. No, I appreciate that, and that may sort of take us, in a sense, to the next historical period. Although, of course, everything's connected in certain respects. Um, David, you wrote a great book, Race and Reunion, which talks about sure. this period, among other things. Um, what's going to follow Reconstruction? You talked about the competing narratives, of course, with regard to the Civil War. That competition continues yeah. in, beyond the Reconstruction. Tell us a little bit about that competition. <laughs> well, the short version of that, some of you know, is that the struggle over the memory of the Civil War begins as soon as the war is being fought, but it really kicks in in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. The lost cause tradition, this cluster of beliefs and stories and narratives that ex-Confederates developed became a quite uh, powerful ideology. It became a powerful set of stories. It was rooted first in this idea that Southerners had to explain defeat. I mean, as have cultures all over the world who have undergone such defeats, whether you're talking about Germany in the First World War or the French in the Franco-Prussian War or back much earlier. And their story of defeat became one of, well, we were never entirely defeated on the battlefield. We were defeated by the Yankee Leviathan, the, as Robert Ely put it in his farewell address, by superior numbers and resources. We were defeated by industry. And then the argument, the most powerful part of the Lost Cause argument that just, that just got driven into the American soul, and not just Southerners, but Northerners as well, is that they never really fought for slavery, that the war wasn't really about slavery, that it was about state sovereignty, that it was about homeland, hearth and homeland. And of course, it was about hearth and homeland, but it was also about slavery. Anyway, by the 1890s and the great monument building era, which you've been hearing about and reading about in recent weeks, from roughly 1890 to the 1920s, when about 75% of all those Confederate monuments were erected, the lost cause became a story not about loss at all, whether it's written by ex-Confederate officers in their memoirs or written by uh, short story authors like Thomas Nelson Page, who wrote the famous Contented Slave Stories and was the best-selling author in the United States in roughly 1893 with huge numbers of Northern readers. 
these were stories after story after story about the faithful, contented old Aunt Harriet and old Uncle Jimmy. Um, the Lost Cause was no, by 1900 was no longer about loss. It was a story about the victory over Reconstruction. It was a victory narrative. And the victory now was not just the South's victory. It was the nation's victory over this uh, awful experiment in racial equality and racial democracy. I'm simplifying a bit, but that's what happens in deep mythologies. Stories get simplified. Now, that doesn't mean that Union victory, uh, the Union victory narrative, um, what I've called in that book uh, the emancipationist narrative, died. It didn't die at all. I mean, it, it, it lost out in this broad, huge cultural struggle over the memory of this most divisive event, but it still had many voices down through the 19th century into the 20th century, and a new generation will pick it up with Du Bois and many others in the 20th century. But this is the most divisive event in American history. How do you put a nation back together? How do you heal out of civil war? Well, you've got to find some kind of unifying narrative. Unfortunately, the tragedy of America's struggle over Civil War memory is that our unifying narrative became a narrative of white supremacy. It became a narrative that wrote black people almost out of the story. It certainly wrote the achievements of this Reconstruction era largely out of the story, such that by the 1930s, something like Gone with the Wind could seem Sweet reason, common sense, and put into a great story, a great epic. Common sense put into a great epic, and you've got a national mythology. Um, I, uh, there's this line I wrote in the preface of Race and Reunion, which I now have reporters reading back to me, which is one of the thrills of my life. <laughs> they say, you say here that as long as America has a politics of race, it will have a politics of Civil War memory. So is that true now, too? Uh, yes. Um, and here we are again, you know, struggling and trying to figure out, why don't we ever get over this? Uh, or why do these monuments matter? Or why, do, why did they all go up in the first place? Uh, who put them there? Uh, um, and should we just take them all down and so forth? Um, but we have probably an eternal problem with how we remember that civil war. As long as we have federalism, and as long as we have racism, we will have the problem. <laughs> yes, and Tavellia, uh, I want to come back to you if I may. Um, it is a re remarkable achievement, I want to tell everybody, to have somebody from Duke and UNC sitting here in such a collegial way. <laughs> I, wa I want you to understand. We fought before we came out. <laughs> and we pleasure. cleaned up all the and, blood. And, and David's going to write the book about who won. No. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but I want to pick up on the point, of course, about monuments. Um, on the point, on the point about monuments. Mm -hmm. Your university, like my university, has had recent struggles with monuments that relate to the Civil War or Civil War period. Um, as a historian, what's your opinion about the, the, the monuments and whether they stay or go? No. That's not fair. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can ask a different question. If you yeah, want. yeah. So. <laughs> As a historian, um, I would just echo what David just said. You know, I mean, we spent the last year or so talking about when they went up, who put them up, who paid for them, should they come down, which one should come down. Um, is Robert E. Lee in the same category as Thomas Jefferson? Uh, all of these questions, and at Duke, of course, um, um, people who had been on the campus for decades finally discovered that there was a Robert E. Lee uh, statue at the chapel. Um, and it turned out that um, the erection of this statue was not a, it was a pretty thoughtless process that went into it. You know, when the campus was being constructed in 1924, the Philadelphia architects um, um, said, oh, well, you know, shouldn't there be like, monuments around the chapel and you know like which religious figures should be up there you should be like secular figures and gotta look old right and the the the, the philadelphia architects didn't have any expertise and so 
they went to historians, or not historians, but scholars at Vanderbilt, and who said, Robert E. Lee, put him up there. And so they did, and then when the uh, construction committee at Duke found out that Robert E. Lee was going up, they were like, hmm, is that a good idea? Um, and they decided it wasn't. And so if you read their minutes, they said, well, if anyone asks, let's just say it's not Lee. <laughs> let's just say it's just a random, random. And it helped that the, the company that built the statue, instead of putting CSA on Lee's belt buckle, mistakenly put US. So that helped. Um, <laughs> and then someone tried to go and scratch it out and put CSA, but anyway. He spent more years in the U.S. Army than he did in the Exactly, CSA. exactly. So um, it was one of, at Duke was one of those unthinking decisions, and I think we were lucky um, that our <laughs> new president, uh, Vincent Price, you know, who uh, uh, came from uh, Penn, um, you know, went directly to the Board of Trustees and said, you know, look, let's, let's act. And they acted um, without a great deal of, of debate or whatever, they just took it down. Um, which doesn't mean that we are free of the problem of monuments. We still have a Confederate soldier at the Duke Chapel. Um, but because he's not well known, he gets a brief reprieve, but I'm about to call him out. Uh, uh, so, um, and so like many institutions, Duke is also now working. Um, we had a President's Commission um, that has done a, just issued a report, and we have um, um, students and, and, and I am working on, on Duke's history because like places like Chicago, Duke said, well, we don't have any connection to slavery because we're a 20th century institution and which is kind of, um, because Duke is, um, uh, Duke's predecessor was Trinity College, and we treasure that link uh, to Trinity College, which is a Methodist school, and whose faculty and president also owned slaves, and so we, we have a great deal to talk about. But to, to briefly, I know we're running out of time here, um, this clock is staring right in front of me. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the, Don't feel rushed. Okay, briefly, in, in terms of monuments, my, the Robert A. Lee statue is down at Duke, and so we've struggled with, should we put something else in it? Um, I think not. Um, people have suggested um, Pauline Murray, people have suggested um, Booker T. Washington, people, Martin Luther King, a number of people. I think it's most effective um, use would be as a blank space, which has all kinds of uh, uh, teaching potential. Um, I am not a, an enthusiast of sort of willy-nilly trying to compete um, with the Confederate landscape by putting monuments up to black people. I think we have to think about what monuments are designed to do, um, what kind of uh, uh, nation state message they um, enact. Mm -hmm. The Confederate monuments were not, as David, um, as David pointed out, they were not just monuments to the Confederacy, but they were also monuments to a particular conception of the nation state of the U.S. as a nation state. And so there are monuments that I would have no trouble saying, oh, you know, take it down. Um, because so many of these things are like manufactured in some northern factory and they all look alike and they're all cheap and ugly um, and they, they more mar the landscape than they make it beautiful and, and even if they were nondescript persons, they're just ugly um, uh, uh, pieces of art. Um, but I think it's important that we're having, we're having this conversation about whether they go or stay. Um, and some of them will come down and some of them will remain. And we can't, I mean, the, the, the hard part for me is that knowing that even if we committed to taking each and every Confederate name statue down, even if we committed to removing the name of every Confederate named 
um, military fort, every Confederate named street, every Confederate named town, every mountain that has a Confederate linkage to it, we would be here forever and we would, I don't think it's gonna happen. So we, we're gonna have to like figure out how to live with some of it. And living with some of it means how do we use these monuments that are on our landscape to transmit history, uh, to tell a different story from the story they were intended to, to tell um, back in the 1890s or 1920s. I appreciate that, and I, I, I want to end with a, what I hope is a fair question. <laughs> um, let me go to you first, if I may, and to you last, David. Um, one of the, we have a lot of great questions from the audience, and of course we haven't had time to ask all of them. Okay. One of them asks how you would suggest or how you would go about um, teaching the history of slavery and emancipation in a more honest way in our elementary and high schools. What advice would you give to those that are teaching this subject and other places such as high schools. Keep in mind, we are here in part because we care about education. That's a big focus of what we do here at the National Constitution Center, and it's of course what you do in your professional lives. So what suggestions would you have? The same, I, I think high school teachers should use the same approach that college teachers use. I mean, most of my students come from high schools where they've had almost nothing about slavery or even the Civil War. They may know more about the Civil War because they've gone on field trips to Gettysburg or um, Benton Place or something. Um, and for me, it's not about standing in front of my students and giving them a lecture about what happened, but it's about carrying them to the archives and having them read the primary sources themselves, having them read printed diaries, having them, now they can find more material online. I mean, to students, when they go to the archive and for the first time, they open a box and pull out a diary, you know, a, a letter from 1864, where, where, then they understand when they read, someone is writing across and they fill up the page and then they turn it around and they write this way because paper is scarce. So that teaches them something too about wartime scarcity. and. But it's just the, 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 the feel um, of this document, to have it in your hand. I mean, students are just uh, taken with mm -hmm. that. And um, I think they are then taken more with doing research projects and learning more. Um, so I give them diaries um, instead of a secondary source. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't, you know, assign my book, but rather I assign the sources that I use to write my mm -hmm. book. Okay, thank you. David? Wow, I think you asked about elementary. Oh, well, Lord. That too. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of teacher institutes. I've been doing them for 20 years in the summer, primarily with high school and middle school teachers. Uh, there is social scientific research now. I was at an all-day conference yesterday in Boston that a little bit was about this, that says we can all recover from whatever we learn in elementary school. So <laughs> one answer is don't worry too much about it. Uh, but that's not a good answer, is it? No, uh, it has to be stories. It has to be stories. And we're hardwired for story. There's a lot of neuroscience on this that shows that we are. We're hardwired for narrative. I used to say that as a question. I don't think it's even a question anymore. You and I as human beings are wired for narrative, story. What do we do with kids? What do we do with children, the youngest? We tell them a story. Now, some of those stories may stick. I have a hard time remembering what stories I learned in elementary school, although if you prod me enough, I can probably come up with some of them. Um, it's gotta be stories. It's gotta be new stories. It's gotta be based on the best research. I was on a textbook review team once some years ago, and we were each given two or three elementary textbooks, two or three middle school, two or three high school textbooks to examine them, read them, review them for how they did American history. What I remember of that is that the elementary text had almost no history at all. The junior high text, by and large, had some history, but disappointingly, but they had a lot about what products are grown in New England, and where the cranberries come from, and on and on and on and on. And, on. 
The high school textbooks were a mixed bag. You know, some of them weren't bad. I was sort of pleasantly surprised. But kids at a young age can, can think historically. They can think about the past. If you do nothing else with a fourth grader but to give them a sense of the past, any past, you've really taught them something. It, it didn't matter what past. I was enthralled with ancient history when I was a kid. I just, I just, I wanted to go to Rome someday. I finally did, not until I was in my 30s. But it just, I was enthralled with old civil, anything old was cool. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's a huge problem, though, of resources, too. If you work with teachers, you realize what they're up against. Some of you are probably teachers. Uh, you're my heroes. I was a high school teacher for seven years, and I've survived to tell it. So, um, I don't know. It's got to be stories. And the more historical you make the story, plant them in time. Time travel. It's what we do anyway with the past. We're just supposed to have evidence for it. I should tell everybody here that our two guests will be um, right outside this room to be able to sign copies of their new book, Beyond Freedom, Disrupting the History of Emancipation. I will tell you, as somebody that studies constitutional history, teaches constitutional law, yeah, I'm like a kid in a candy store with guests like you. This mm. is nice. a great honor for me to be with people who have enlightened and enriched my understanding of history and the Constitution. We've all been lucky today to be part of this terrific conversation, which will continue, I know, into the future. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Way to go there. <laughs>